Hi, my name is Jay Zampini. I'm a spine surgeon at the Brigham and Women's Hospital here in Boston. Uh, with the first thank the organizers, uh, Krishna and uh, Kieran, for uh, including me in this. Uh, this is a topic that I uh, find near and dear to my heart. And we, we do take a lot of trauma call. Yeah, at the Brigham, it tends to actually be a lot more infection and tumor call. Uh, but certainly, we, we see a lot of, um, of blood trauma here in Boston. Um, so without going on about myself or what I'm interested in, let me share my screen with you. Uh, and start, actually, let me share my screen with you. Let me start my, uh, my talk. Okay, so uh, as a matter of disclosure, I have no financial interest or conflict of interest to discuss here. Everything that you'll see if there are devices that is approved for use around the world. Uh, I like to think that my opinions are well-reasoned and insightful. They're my principles. If you don't like them, I probably have others. We can, go, we can talk about that over a drink, maybe. So let's start with a trauma case. Um, this is a 58 year old male came into an outside hospital Friday night, high speed motor vehicle collision, no loss of consciousness, but his car was totaled. Came in with neck pain, normal neuro, combative at the time, and was intubated. They get an x-ray for the trauma evaluation. Looks fairly normal, but the guy has neck pain. They call the uh, spine surgeon on call and says, I'm not coming in just to clear, clear a CD collar. Get a CAT scan and I'll, I'll, I'll see him you know, if there's any issue. They get a CAT scan. Now he has a fractured. Now it's clear that he has a fractured dislocation. Also, they take the breathing tube out to do an exam and he can't move. So of course, they've called the spine surgeon back and they says, well, you know what, now I'm just not comfortable taking care of this. This has to go to a tertiary care center. Unfortunately, we, at the Brigham here where they called, we're up to, too busy taking care of tumors and infections. There's no bed available. So stays in the ICU there, puts them on the OR schedule for Monday, stays flat, uh, head of bed, at bed rest. By Monday, he's starting to get a bit of a pneumonia. Um, surgeon takes him for a closed reduction. Uh, the post-reduction MRI shows this. So spinal cord, looks like maybe there's some spinal cord compression that probably explains why he doesn't have uh, uh, neurologic function. Looks like the spinal cord is compressed so the surgeon performs a laminectomy because of course, he performed a laminectomy for spinal cord compression. A follow-up, this is what it looks like. So my question is what if anything went wrong here? So I'm going to talk for the next 20, 30 minutes about cervical spine imaging. Uh, and really, spine imaging is just another way to say spine anatomy. Uh, I feel that in orthopedics, uh, orthopedics of the spine, the anatomy and the physiology of the spine drive pretty much all the understanding of any of the conditions that we treat, including degenerative tumor infection uh, and trauma, of course. I mean, the spine pathology involves deformation or destruction of one or more of those structures of the spine. Sometimes it's slow over the course of time, like in degen. Sometimes it's medium term, like infection or tumor. Sometimes it's rapid, like trauma. And the question about imaging is how do we adequately identify the anatomy that we're looking for? Do we, are we looking at bone, soft tissue, or a neural anatomy? Those are sort of the three basic things we can see. In the setting of trauma, one question is also when do you get imaging? What imaging? to get and, and what to do if you're in a facility that doesn't have advanced imaging. We'll talk a little bit, I'll talk a little bit about some injury patterns as well as um, we'll do some representative cases. So what to order and when, it really depends on what you wanna see. Um, for the non-trauma stuff, if it's, if it's degen, you wanna find an explanation of the symptoms. Does axial pain or neurologic pain correlate with an anatomic finding? In tumor, it's what is the tumor burden? Is there neural involvement? And how bad is the bony destruction? Trauma kind of takes all of that and makes it much, much of a, a faster time frame. We're looking at bone and discal ligamentous injury and, and identifying a source of neurologic complaints. The, the tools that we have at our disposal are both static and, and more functional or dynamic. Um, static, of course, CAT scan, MRI, and uh, supine X-ray. Functional is more of a weight bearing or, or controlled dynamic. Uh, the goals of imaging in the setting of trauma are really threefold. Num number one, uh, to avoid missing any injury. 
um, because of course we don't want someone to leave our, our facility and, and then develop a problem because of something we missed. As surgeons, we don't want to miss instability because that is something that we can actually do something about. So spine imaging, not quite. So spine imaging, first let's talk about some instability because this concept of instability is really what we're getting at with the, the main, the crux of looking at any kind of an imaging study is to identify uh, instability that we can actually treat surgically. So the, the Bible of, of spinal um, biomechanics uh, was written in the 1970s by Gus White and Manohar Punjabi. Uh, and what they said is very basic, is that stability is the ability of the spine to resist mechanical deformation, neurologic compromise, and pain under normal physiologic mode. So great, so, so what is stable? Is, is this unstable? Uh, this is a, a CAT scan that shows maybe 25% Anterolisthesis at uh, C67, perch was set on one side, jumps was set on the other, and, and diastasis of the uh, uh, spinous processes. Fair to say that this is unstable. But what about this? Another CAT scan, maybe less, maybe 10 to 15% of, of anterolisthesis, spinous process fracture, but no diastasis, and a facet fracture, but not a dislocation or jump. So what is stable? The stability is inferred. We don't have a test for stability uh, that can safely assess whether or not a ligament, disc, or bone is disrupted. We infer the stability uh, and infer the biomechanics uh, on the imaging. And we rely mostly on, on expert opinion more than actual evidence like you would um, like you'd see for a lot of other conditions of the spine or other things in orthopedics. But in biomechanics, uh, the, the biomechanics of injury lead to uh, a predictable number of patterns of injury that, uh, and this was described back 40 years ago by um, uh, Ferguson and Allen, uh, these six different types of, of uh, biomechanical force uh, lead to patterns of injury. Axial compression, like a compression or burst fracture, flexion compression, flexion distraction, compressive extension, distractive extension, and then translation. Each of these um, mechanisms has a degree of injury that's based on the amount of energy uh, transmitted through the spine. Uh, for, for a long time, this is all we had. Um, if you look at how they came up with this you know, 40 or so years ago, the only tools they had were x-rays and, and early CAT scans. You know, MRIs weren't really around and the, and the CAT scans weren't sophisticated like they became over the last 20 years. I mean, even when I started training 20 years ago, you know, the multi-detector CTs that could scan the whole body in seconds, that was only just coming online in, in 2000. Now, so now we understand a lot more because we have better imaging and we understand that the, the ligaments and discs are much more important than we, we uh, considered formally. Um, and we'll take a look at some examples in a bit. So I mentioned that there are three goals of, of, um, of imaging. The, the third goal is probably the most important and that's to plan treatment and make accurate decisions. Like, is something stable or unstable? Do you need a brace or do you need surgery? You want to be able to hit the nail right on the head, so to speak. Not something like this. And this, I actually, this was in my house when I bought it. I, I can't imagine what the rest of their decor looked like. So to make these uh, accurate plans and decisions, this is where classification is important. Um, and I would ask, is, is there an I ideal classification scheme of anything in orthopedics, spine included? Uh, an ideal classification would identify all injuries, would guide treatment in all circumstances, and then predict outcomes of treatment in all circumstances. And I would say there, there's not really an ideal, like a 100% perfect ideal, but we have gotten better and better. Uh, 40 years ago, Ferguson and Allen, Allen and Ferguson, uh, depending on who you ask, uh, had a, a mechanistic-based uh, classification, like I mentioned uh, a slide or two ago. Uh, Denis, came up a year later with this idea that there are columns of stability of the spine, again, also using x-ray and early CAT scan uh, to, to formulate that, that concept. Fast forward to the early 2000s and the uh, thoracolumbar injury classification score and subaxial uh, uh, cervical injury classification, TLIX and SLIC, they looked at morphology of the injury, uh, morphology basically meaning mechanism, but uh, but slightly different. It's just what it looks like on imaging. Uh, neurologic injury and then ligamentous injury. These are the three things that surgeons would include um, 
uh, informally after looking formally for the, what they thought of as the mechanism of, uh, of injury based on the, of the imaging. So just to, to uh, digress uh, one second into telix, and I know this is only this is really a cervical talk and there will be thoracolumbar talks. This is where it really all began with uh, the more modern understanding of classification. Um, and this was put together by a panel of international experts. Um, you know, some would say because they sort of had a feel for what should and shouldn't be operated on. There, there's also legend that um, they put this together so that they could, they could justify what they were operating on. Um, in reality, it, it, I think the former is more true. It, it is a reproducible and predictive model. It was not initially validated, but has been over the course of time. And surgery is indicated if the spine meets certain criteria. So morphology, you know, the more energy of injury, the higher the, higher the score. Compression or burst is the least energy. Translation or distraction is the most. Neurologic injury, um, a cauda or quina or Incomplete injury are actually more serious than complete in terms of what can go wrong if not stabilized. That's why it's a higher score. And then now this concept of posterior ligamentous complex. Uh, this formalizes or, or codifies uh, the concept that the ligaments are important in the stability. If it's perfectly intact, if you think it's out, or if it's truly injured based on seeing a ligament disrupted or seeing a demon. So to take a look at two, two examples, uh, by Ferguson Allen, this on the left would be a flexion compression injury, high energy, but flexion compression. By Telix, it's rotation, you know, rotating in flexion. Uh, she happened to have a complete cord injury and you can see from, uh, actually I don't have it on here, but from the diastasis of the spinous processes, a complete PLC injury. So three, four, five, six, seven, uh, if that's greater than four, this is something that should have surgery. I think that's probably obvious to, to most viewing this, but um, if you needed to justify or codify how you made, made that decision, the telic score is nice. Compared to this, this is an axial compression injury, maybe with a burst component, intact neuro and intact posterior ligamentous complex, two points for injury, stable injury should not need surgery. For the subaxial C-spine, same concepts. This, uh, this is the, Alan Ferguson, Ferguson Allen for, for thoracolumbar, lumbar, Allison, or Allen and Ferguson for cervical. I guess they switched off whose name came first. Uh, for the slick classification, same idea here, although uh, they decided after making TLICs that a, a translational injury was actually somewhat worse than a, a distraction injury, like a perch facet or a jump facet. But same idea for now discal ligamentous uh, and, and for neurologic injury. So to classify uh, this type of injury that we see in both CAT scan and, and MRI, you see an anterior translation, maybe 25 to 50%, perch facet, no fractures posteriorly, no fractures anteriorly. This is a distractive flexion injury. Doesn't say that, uh, just doesn't say how bad it is because that's all that they really get with this. By, by the slight classification, there's translation forward, that's four points. You can see um, edema or myelomalacia here, central cord injury, and then you can see edema in the, the disc um, and, and disruption of the ligamentum flafum, so it's disc ligamentous injury. So this right here says a lot more clearly that this is a high energy injury, this is unstable, this needs to go for surgery. For the upper cervical spine, it's a little bit different. There, there's no uh, codified way of saying these injuries are stable or unstable. They're a lot less common, at least where, uh, where I work and where I have worked. Um, the upper cervical spine anatomy is unique at the occiput C1 and C2. And the way I look at it, all the structures are vulnerable. Uh, there are some classic fracture patterns of each of the structures of the upper cervical spine. And I think if you look at each one from the top down on whatever image you have, you really won't miss anything. The injury patterns are predictable. You know that there is an occipital condyle, uh, occipital cervical uh, junction from O1 uh, uh, joint. There are C1 fractures. There are C1 two dislocations or, or rotatory subluxations, and there are C2 fractures. So if you start out looking for each of these patterns from the top down, you won't miss anything. Occipital condyle fractures. And I'm not, not going to go into each of the specific um, types because I think that's a little bit beyond uh, the scope of this talk. But it's something that if you if you 
read through these classification systems of occipital fractures, O1 dislocations, C1 fractures, C2 fractures, uh, and then um, the C2 pars fracture. I think you, you won't miss anything if you, if you take it that way. So finally, let's talk about some spine imaging. So again, the goals, we don't wanna miss an injury, we don't wanna miss instability, and we wanna be able to plan treatment. Uh, the initial decision for what to do is, is often practical, that sometimes you can't get the ideal imaging study because of injury burden. Um, the ABCDE of, the, of ATLS is that way for a reason. If the airway and breathing are compromised, the spine takes a back seat for now. The other, part, the other practical part of decision-making for what to get is the availability. You know, we're, we're fortunate uh, in Boston that most of our hospitals do have uh, early and, and um, uh, you know, 24 hour availability of, of CT and MRI. Um, that's not always the case. Uh, typically we would start with something static because we don't know what the stability is until we've uh, fully assessed someone. Uh, a supine X-ray, a CAT scan or MRI are static. Uh, functional is uh, an upright X-ray where uh, we have gravity and weight bearing affecting, potentially affecting alignment and then controlled inflection extension. So to start with the lateral x-ray, this was part of ATLS when I trained um, starting 20 years ago. So it has been generally supplanted by use of CT because the, the CAT scans now uh, by and large are multi-detector and rapid um, and can get a much better picture. But an x-ray is still really important. Um, an x-ray, a, a good lateral x-ray will show you vertebral body alignment, spinal laminar alignment, uh, Right there, those three measurements will identify most subaxial injuries. Uh, typically in trauma, these are done supine with the youngest resident, if I remember correctly, pulling on the arms to try to make sure that the shoulders are low enough so that, that you can actually see this, the uh, cervical thoracic junction. Any trauma evaluation should include at least a lateral C-spine or ideally a CAT scan. For the subaxial C-spine, the, the, sagittal, the sagittal view is, is analogous to a lateral. And you can see the same, uh, you know, the same lines, anterior vertebral body, posterior vertebral body, spinal laminar line. Um, because it is multiplanar, you can also get a feel for the pedicles and facets to see if there is a fracture or dislocation or if there's diastasis of the spinous process that you see here. In the axial plane, it's a segmental evaluation of each individual bone. I personally go through each structure, the vertebral body, the transverse process, pedicle, uh, lateral mass or facet joint, lamina. And if you do that at each level, again, hard to miss stuff if you're keeping that systematic approach. CT is also much, much better than x-ray for occipital cervical. And what I do is I start out with the, the uh, coronals. Look at the occipital condyles first. Look at the way that uh, o, uh, occipital C1 is aligned. Look for uh, C1 lateral mass fractures. Uh, C1 to uh, overlap dens on the sagittal uh, relationship of the occiput, you know, and the, uh, the anterior and posterior, the frame and magnum to C1 and C2. And there are several different measurements you can make. Again, I, I don't want to go into all of these individual lines, but more of a, a gestalt that the hole in the head should be over the hole in the neck. Uh, again, occipital cervical, C1 fractures on the the axial C2 fractures on the uh, sagittals. Again, if you go from top down, it's hard to miss something if you, if you try to um, uh, consciously identify each structure in each fracture pattern. Now, cervical MRI. I, MRI is, is, of course, much more ideal for soft tissue. Um, it actually doesn't see bone at all. Bone is only really a shadow on the MRI based on the, the fluid and fat content around it. So it's a perfect uh, or more perfect test for uh, tissues with fluid content or fat content. Uh, the T2-weighted sequence is uh, the workhorse of spine. You can, of course, see the ligaments. This is ligaments and flavum. You can see if that's disrupted. I once had a resident tell me that the ligament and flavum is like the ACL of the spine. As you know, on an ACL uh, MRI, the whole thing is just ruptured. There's nothing left. So you see no black line here that where the flavum is. You can see disc herniations. You can also see spinal cord edema, which neither of these shows. Uh, on the STIR sequence, STIR is, is functionally a T2 fat suppressed 
which means it only shows fluid. So of course, CSF, you can see disc injuries, you can see soft tissue injuries, and that, that's heralded by, by a high signal or, uh, or edema on the stir. One of the questions of debate really for the last 20 years is when is an MRI necessary or is it necessary? Again, sometimes it's practical that if it's not available, you can't get it. Uh, most clinically important injuries will be seen on CT. And that, that's something that one of my colleagues uh, here at, at Harvard uh, put together just a few years ago, that 92% of all injuries seen over something like 3,000 patients, 92% uh, of the injuries were identified on CAT scan only. Uh, and of the ones that required the MRI, only 1% of them went on to need surgery. So 1% of 8%. So very uncommon that the MRI will drastically change judgment. CAT scan will, should be able to identify nearly all unstable injuries. Now, if you have to identify something um, neurologic, a CT myelogram is also an alternative. This is um, kind of an old school way of identifying the neural axis that requires intrathecal contrast injection, usually in the lumbar spine. And in some ways, this is actually better than MRI because you can differentiate between contrast in the CSF. Um, here you see an axial, so contrast in the CSF, bone, ligament, and of course the nerves. Uh, it is invasive, it requires expertise, and it requires that the, the technique be done, be done well to, to see that. But this is, this is a good alternative to an MRI uh, if you need to sort of understand, is there a hematoma compressing uh, the spinal cord or fecal sac? Is there a, a herniated disc that would need to be addressed surgically? So let's just take a couple case examples to put this together. Uh, this is uh, an 89-year-old male I saw who fell down several stairs at home. Complex complaint of neck pain that does not radiate, doesn't have neurologic complaints. At, uh, the sagittal CAT scan, uh, among other things, shows that you maybe have some ankylosis here from uh, disc and facet degeneration. Has some, um, uh, most likely this uh, calcification seen behind the dens is often uh, representative of uh, CPPD uh, deposition. But you know, the obvious is that he has a C2 odontoid fracture. Looks like it's not displaced, but it is dorsally angulated. He also has a, a C1 arch fracture. For something like this, because he doesn't have neurologic uh, complaints, uh, an MRI generally is not needed. We're, we're not necess we don't necessarily identify the upper C-spine ligaments as well in MRI because they're you know, often too small for the resolution of the MRI. Um, everything except for like the tectorial membrane and the um, anterior and posterior and then occipital membranes. Another case, 59-year-old female, fell down several stairs at home, complained of neck pain, but now with bilateral arm paresthesia and weakness. So CAT scan shows that there looks like an angular deformity between C5-6, maybe a compression deformity of C6, diastasis of these spinous processes. So this is by Alan Ferguson, a flexion compression injury. Um, she has clearly a, uh, a, a ligamentous injury, maybe a disc injury, certainly a posterior ligamentous injury and a neuro injury. So this would be something that an MRI would be ideal for. And you can see, you know, fortunately she reduced by the time she got to the MRI scan. There is a ligamentous injury. That nice clean line of the um, ligamentum flavum is disrupted here. And a, a, the stir sequence would be ideal to see, again, that, that, this, um, that there is edema in the vertebral body. As for whether or not we do surgery, this is a translational injury and an incomplete spinal cord injury. So just by that, three points, uh, four plus three, uh, seven points plus two for the ligamentous injury. So a so fairly sure thing that most people, I think, would agree on that this is a, a, an operative fracture. Now, a 34-year-old man was unfortunately assaulted. He has neck pain and C6 radiculitis. CAT scan shows, again, an, a posterior translational deformity. It, it looks almost like his, his um, upper subaxial spine was sort of rammed down into C, uh, two, three, four, five, into C, C6. You know, this is kind of as bad as a flexion compression injury gets. This is a so-called flexion teardrop. For this, uh, I would want to get an MRI because he has C6 radiculitis and also to know if, if there is a posterior ligamentous injury. 
that in the setting of, uh, of an anterior burst like this, that can sometimes determine, do we need to do something to restore tension band in the back? And you can see on the MRI that uh, somehow he's got this wide open canal. Fortunately, I didn't have a spinal cord injury. Um, there, there was C6 radicular compression uh, from bony fragments, but posterior ligaments are all intact. So in, in, um, in my hands, this was an anterior operation for decompression and stabilization. So I hope that kind of summarizes the way that um, imaging should be approached in the setting of trauma. And again, imaging is just another way to say anatomy. Uh, if you are systematic and look for every injury pattern, and there really are only, there's a finite number of types of injury that can be identified. Um, if you learn the, the, the few classification schemes that are, are uh, now currently used, especially SLIC and, SLIC and TLIX, um, that should suffice to identify nearly anything that's going to, to change treatment, either need to have some kind of immobilization or need surgery. Uh, X-ray and CAT scan, uh, if that's all that's available, that should suffice, especially if, if a CAT scan can be done with a, a myelogram injection. And of course, if you do this, you can hopefully not let this happen. We could go into the, um, you know, how this all happened. And this was fortunately not one patient, but you know, clearly the surgeon didn't identify the instability, did the wrong operation uh, in the setting of instability. Uh, so I think if, if um, the imaging were really well uh, explored and, and studied that something like this would not have happened. Well, thank you all very much for listening. I, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk here. This is my email if you have any questions, and I, I believe I will be around for the case discussion. 